Howdy, I'm the Amateur Logician. For fun and games, we're going to look at a high school geometry book. In particular, we're going to be looking at the chapter on basic logic. So this is Tutor in a Book's Geometry, and it's definitely designed for a high school class. Um, you can self-study from it. The only negative thing I would say about it is that it's a little bit cluttered, but other than that, it's not a bad book at all. Chapter 3 is on logic, so we're going to go through that a little bit here. So we'll go to page 31. Sometimes terminology differs, and that's one thing I don't like. Um, in a geometry class, they won't call the antecedent. The antecedent, they'll call it the premise or hypothesis. They won't call the consequent the consequent, they'll call it the conclusion. Not my favorite thing. But this is on chapter 3, um, the if-then conditional. Then it gets into the so-called law of detachment. And then we get into... Um, contrapositives, converses, inverses, and some examples here. And that continues on this page. But also, we have the law of the syllogism, which is really a hypothetical syllogism. And then we get into indirect proofs, which are really cool. These are very, very basic, but they're still interesting to to think about. So let's just go through some of this, and I'll show you my notes that we'll think about Tudor in a book's geometry. So the first thing we'll get into is the if-then statement. So here we have if P then Q. So we call P, oftentimes in high school geometry, the premise or the hypothesis. I prefer the term antecedent. And we call Q the conclusion. I prefer the word consequent, but in any case, an example might be if you live in Phoenix, then you live in Arizona. So P is you live in Phoenix, Q is you live in Arizona. All right. And then we have the so-called law of detachment. So the if-then statement is false when there's at least one counterexample. So if we have, let's say, a true hypothesis, a true antecedent, but it leads to something that's a false conclusion, a false consequence, then the conditional if-then statement is false. So here's an example. If x is greater than 1, then x is greater than 2. Would that be a true or false conditional? Well, we can think of one counterexample. For example, what if x is 1 and 5 tenths, 1.5? Well, then it's false because it's not the case that 1.5 is greater than 2. So while 1.5 satisfies this antecedent or that hypothesis, it's false for that conclusion. Okay, so we have a false conditional. Okay. Then we can think about contrapositives, converses, and inverses. So that is a important topic when thinking about conditionals. So the original statement is just if P, then Q. Then we have the contrapositive, which is if not Q, then not P. So we're flipping the premise, hypothesis, and the conclusion. So we're flipping the P and the Q, and we're negating them. So if not Q, then not P is the contrapositive. We have the converse, if Q, then P. We just flip the P and the Q there. And then the inverse. We just negate the P and we negate the Q. So if not P, then not Q. So take the example, if you live in Phoenix, then you live in Arizona. Well, that's true. Okay, And we can diagram this. The book calls this a Venn diagram. I think it's better to thought of as an Euler circle. If I can write here. Oh, boy. Okay, Euler circle. Okay, so here is Phoenix, and it's part of Arizona. So if you live in Phoenix, then you live in Arizona. So that's true. Let's go to my next page. How about the contrapositive? As you can see, I do this very amateurishly sometimes, these videos, but anyways... If you don't live in Arizona, then you don't live in Phoenix. So we flipped the P and the Q, we negated each of them respectively. So if you don't live in Arizona, then you don't live in Phoenix. Well, that's true, right? That would be a true one. 
So we can diagram it this way. So here, Phoenix is part of the circle of Arizona, but here you are outside of it. So if you don't live in Phoenix, pardon me, blah, 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 blah. if you don't live in Arizona, then you don't live in Phoenix. So that is a true statement. Awesome. How about this one? We'll think about the converse. If you live in Arizona, then you live in Phoenix. Well, not necessarily, so that's definitely false. And we can illustrate this, so maybe you live over here, let's say in Tempe, or Tucson, or um, somewhere else, so it is a false uh, proposition. We can think of a counter example. You can live in Arizona without living in Phoenix. Here's the inverse. If you don't live in Phoenix, then you don't live in Arizona. Would that be true or false? Well, again, it would be false, the inverse. And the same diagram really can represent this example. So maybe you live in Flagstaff. You're still living in Arizona. So this is a false uh, proposition, a statement. Then we have the so-called law of a syllogism. I don't like this terminology in some ways, but in geometry high school courses, they use this often. So if P, then Q, if Q, then R. So thus, if P, then R. So for example, if you live in Phoenix, then you live in Arizona. If you live in Arizona, you live in the U.S. So therefore, if you live in Phoenix, you live in the U.S. So we, just have, we have a chain of, um, of conditional if-then statements there. Great. And then we get into a really interesting topic called indirect proofs. Now, when I was in a high school geometry class many moons ago, I don't think we did indirect proofs. Um, but here you get to do some of them, which is pretty cool. So an indirect proof is versus a so-called direct proof or regular proof. So what we're going to do here is that we assume temporarily the negation of what we want to prove. We derive a contradiction. Hence, it must be that the assumption must be false. So that's basically the general structure of a um, indirect proof. But why does that work? We can think about this a little bit more in detail. So contradictions cannot be true. That's why an indirect proof works. And what is not true must be false. Hence, the assumption must be false. That's essentially how an indirect proof works. We can also say it's based on the law of excluded middle. If we have a proposition, it's going to be true or false, but not both of them. right? Or in other words, the negation of the assumption must be true. So we have an assumption. That assumption leads to a contradiction, so that assumption must be false. And so the negation of that assumption must be true. Okay, so if we start out, let's say, with the assumption of P, we derive a contradiction, then we conclude that not P is the case. So here's a really, really simple example from the textbook, but it's actually kind of fun um, to apply it even to these simple examples. So here we have two angles. We have angle A, we have angle B. We're given that angle A does not equal angle B, that the measurements are not equal, so this is what is given. We want to prove that angle A and angle B are not both right angles, and we're going to do an indirect proof. So this is pretty straightforward then. So our proof starts with the assumption. We're going to assume A and B are right angles. Okay. Well, this implies that the measurement of angle A and the measurement of angle B are 90 degrees. But then it follows that the measurement of angle A equals the measurement of angle B. This contradicts the given info that the measurement of angle A does not equal the measurement of angle B. So we're given that from the outset. Therefore, angle A and angle B are not both at right angles. So we took this assumption, angle A and angle B are right angles. We deny it, so we just say it's not the case. So we reach our conclusion through an indirect proof. So studying geometry is one of the best ways, actually, to strengthen our logical reasoning skills. And 
in many ways, Euclidean geometry is neglected. You take a course in Euclidean geometry, in so-called synthetic geometry, and then boom, you're done with it, and you focus so much on analytical geometry. Most math majors, um, including myself in the past, I mean, you don't focus that much on geometry in this synthetic way. A lot of times you're just thinking about geometry on the Cartesian coordinate plane and so forth. But in any case, it's an interesting subject, and I think through the years I've become more interested in basic geometry. I wasn't always a big fan of it, but it actually is a very interesting part of mathematics and is part of the so-called quadrivium, if we think about a classical traditional education. Um, but anyway, this is just kind of an overview of this chapter. I guess the only thing I didn't cover, maybe I should have, is just thinking about negations a little bit more. Um, but um, other than that, this is basically what you get in this in this chapter. And there's, of course, much more to this book. And I'll leave a link to it if you're interested in studying some high school level geometry. Thank you for watching, and be well. I'm the Amateur Logician.